All right, good afternoon everyone. Um, I'm Hema J. Seelan, Assistant Professor at Cedarville University. And this research project um, is, I've, I've done it with, uh, as a team. Um, I have my advisor here, Dr. Bruce Russell, and uh, this research was performed at Oklahoma State University while I was a PhD student. And I have my uh, fellow teammate here, Ala, and he's now a structural uh, design engineer at Walter P. Moore. So it's more of a collaboration work. Uh, we worked on steel bridges, concrete bridges, and I want to discuss about the type of instrumentation that we used and implemented and what kind of sensors we used and what we did with the data. <coughs> Today I'm going to talk about uh, three bridges here. So the first one um, is the prototype bridge. It's a steel bridge with a concrete deck on top and was built in uh, Stillwater, Oklahoma, um, inside the laboratory of Oklahoma State University, the Burt Cooper Engineering Lab, and then the two other bridges are the field bridges. The State Highway 11 uh, Chikash uh, Chikashka, oh, built over the Chikashka River, and then we have the, um, on K County, and then we have the State Highway 4, North Canadian. That's a concrete bridge. All right, so first I'm going to start with the prototype bridge, and then we started with the idea, like, what are we doing with this and you know what kind of sensors we can use so we tried to use the experience we gained from the uh, prototype bridge and implement it in the field bridge so we employed several type of sensors we try to um, monitor data strain data temperature data from them and then we use them to analyze it and Im implement the same for the field bridge so first i'm going to start with my prototype bridge so this is a full-size bridge built inside the Burt Cooper Engineering Lab at Oklahoma State University. And it's a replica of the Eagle Chief Creek Bridge A uh, in State Highway 14, Woods County, Oklahoma. It was about, it's about 40 feet long. Uh, it had two steel girders at six feet apart. And the bridge was like 14 feet wide with a four feet overhang. So we installed at least uh, 100 sensors in the bridge. We had vibrating wire sensors monitoring the strain data and the temperature data. We had thermocouples as well. Um, and then we had um, LVDTs. We had electrical resistance strain gauges. Because it was a laboratory setting, we were easy to, it was much easier to install them, although it needed a lot of tedious work trying to um, clean up the surface of the bridge, and especially the steel girders, and polish them and trying to stick them but we were able to get some good data and good strain profile from that. We also implemented inclinometers at the supports, trying to find what the inclination would be, the curvature of the bridge, and from there calculate the deflection. It's just an additional way of trying to see, okay, how can we use these inclinometers um, versus the LVDTs, because LVDTs are hard to install on the field sometimes. So we also had LVDTs to correlate that data. This is a cross-section of the bridge, um, one section of the bridge at mid-span. You can see the two girders there six feet apart, and we had vibrating wire sensors right in the middle of the bridge, and we also had thermocouples. We had LVDT supports measuring the deflections uh, for the steel bridge girders and in the overhands as well. So for our research, we use, we're a big fan of Campbell Scientific, and we've been using that for a lot of our research. Uh, it's very versatile. We're able to use a variety of sensors, and then it's seamless, um, you know, into a, a single interface system. We were ha able to have a lot of multiplexers from Campbell Scientific that we're able to connect all these sensors to increase the channels, and then we were um, have able to record data through them. So we've been having a lot of success using Campbell Scientific in a uh, logger, uh, the database, uh, the data logger itself with their multiplexers, but the sensors themselves, we were able to use a diverse variety of them. We also had um, a battery backup. Uh, although we had direct supply of uh, power, we still used a battery backup just in case we lost power. Uh, but we used kind of multiplexers for the strain gauges for the thermocouples, and they were all ch uh, wired and channeled, and we used a logger net programmer to program all these sensors. So we built, uh, we had the steel girders delivered, we built the form work for it, and we had placed all the steel, so we were getting, placed all the instrumentation, we were getting ready for the concrete to be placed. So we, this, this bridge was um, cast on July 13th, 2017. And we started casting about 10.55 a.m. in the morning. And by within two hours, we were able to finish 
uh, with a broom finish and we were collecting data before the cast right through the cast and then uh, continue it afterward as well. So we were able to capture all that data from, you know, during the process of construction. So we allowed the bridge to cure for about 14 days. We used wet burlap sacks and then we used plastic sheets uh, and we continue to cure the bridge. So these are some of the short term uh, monitoring data. We'll go into the long term, but I wanted to highlight some of the short term data here. So the first graph that we see uh, is the temperature data uh, versus the, the concrete strains from the wide and wide strain gauges. So you can see due to the heat of hydration, the concrete reached a high temperature of 114 degrees Fahrenheit. The ambient temperatures were 73 degrees inside the lab. So still the concrete heated up and we can see the temperature strains the, from the vibrating wire gauges were able to follow the same pattern. So basically the concrete was heating up and expanding and all that strain data we were able to capture it and following the profile as the temperature. And this is a little bit further uh, from 0 to 96 hours, a little, uh, for, for the, for, from 48 to 96 you can see that as the temperature reading kind of cool, uh, the deck cools back and you know comes to the ambient temperature, we can see the concrete strains also continue, but they still continue to decrease or increase in compression as the concrete is trying to uh, shrink and it's continue, you can see the increase in profile, although the temperature readings are kind of, you know, ambient at that point. Right, so this is a correlation that we did. Uh, so what happens when this temperature increases, we have increase in strains as well, what happens to the bridge deflection? So we found out the deflection of the bridge also followed the same pattern. As the bridge deck heats up, you can see the bridge cambers up. This is a steel girder bridge with a concrete deck on top and it's kind of pulling the whole thing up. And then as it cools down, you can see the same profile coming. For both the girders, we were able to measure the same. So you can see the temperature fluctuations in the field uh, with the environmental temperatures. We were able to see the same kind of pattern. So this was another data that we wanted to collect. Um, so we had we had um, shrinkage prisms. We sampled the concrete. We tested the fresh concrete properties. Uh, the concrete mix, mix was according to uh, the ODOT specifications. And then it was a, we used a type 1, type 2 concrete with a 20% fly ash with 5% air. So the typical concrete that Oklahoma Department of Transportation would use. So with that data, we were able to measure the strains in the concrete, but we also had shrinkage prisms where we physically measured the unrestrained shrinkage in the shrinkage prism. We were able to compare it with the restrained shrinkage in the concrete deck. So you can see a, a difference about almost 200 micro strains between the restrained and the unrestrained shrinkage. So we are comparing the bridge deck uh, that's undergoing shrinkage, but you have the girders that's kind of restraining it. But when we have uh, the purple data refers to the unrestrained shrinkage of the shrinkage prisons where they're not restrained anymore and they continue to shrink. So this is an interesting data uh, for us to see how you know kind of correlate to bridge deck cracking. Um, <clears throat> this we were not able to separate out the creep in it, but I believe that we have some kind of creep action also going on here that kind of contributes to that um, along with the shrinkage and contributing to the cracking of the bridge decks. But in, in our bridge deck, we didn't see any cracks. Um, we cured it for the full 14 days. We removed farm work. We were able, there wasn't any visible cracks in the bridge. So I think that was a successful one. Uh, but although the temperatures were much more controlled within the laboratory. So having this experience uh, of being of having built a bridge in the lab and trying to monitor data, we were able to take that and use it on a field bridge. So this is a state highway 11 over the Chikaske River in Kay County, Oklahoma. So we had plate girder bridges 54 um, inches deep um, and, uh, and a three quarter inch thick plates, I believe. And this was the bridge that were that was con after construction, right here, right here. We have the uh, pictures during the process of construction. So we chose certain points uh, within the bridge deck to monitor and uh, apply sensors to. We, we used the similar type of sensors that we used in the laboratory bridge. Uh, so we were able to capture data during the time of construction as well. So we had uh, a total span of, we had four 100 feet spans. There were six girder lines and with a 30 degree skew and we were able to 
instrument three girders. So we, our choice of selection was based on the axis. So because the ESMO span was easy to access, we were able to put our data loggers there and have all the sensors wired in. So like the, the same application as the um, lab, lab bridge, prototype bridge, we used thermocouples, we used vibrating wire gauges to measure the temperatures in the steel, the, uh, the strains in the concrete. And we did use some LVDTs, but most of the data was around the strains and the thermocouples. Um, this was like a test data. We wanted to test and see if we could uh, actually use an adhesive for the vibrating wire gauges because we could use them on the steel girders themselves. So we did kind of a test coloration. What would happen if we were to glue it or if we had to weld it? So we had similar correlation, but the correlation is pretty close. Um, we decided to um, glue them in the field to the steel girder themselves. You can see that in the next slide right here. So we have the profile there, we have a concrete deck on top and a steel girder and we have the red, um, the red ones represent, the red squares represent the thermocouples and the green circles represent vibrating wire gauges. So we were able to install, install them and capture the gradient and also at different um, varying depths of the girdle. So this was our instrumentation setup. We had again the same um, Campbell Scientific data logger. We used various sensors and multiplexers that kind of uh, help us to have a lot more channels in there. We used a battery backup and we used photovoltaic solar panels to give us a continuous power supply. Right. So this uh, data correlates to the short term uh, temperature data. So all we were able to capture all that information from the thermocouples here. Uh, we do have some vibrating wire, but you can see all the thermo. We had at least eight thermocouples for the entire gradient, and we were able to capture the concrete temperatures and the steel temperatures and ambient temperature during the process of heat of hydration. So very similarly, the temperatures heated up, uh, even though the deck was cast early in the morning. They heated up to 130 degrees Fahrenheit, and then. We had the top flange of the steel girder heat up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So at the completion of the heat of hydration uh, and cooling, you can see the temperature starts to cool down. So this is the strain data that we were able to plot from the vibrating wire strain gauges for the same period of time. You can see it follows exactly the same profile as the temperature readings. As the bridge deck heats up, you can see the increase of strains. And then once it starts cooling, it starts to come back. But in addition to that, we also see this is kind of a long term, um, a little for a longer duration. You can also see the variations there. So the top graph is the aim and temperature reading, readings for the State Highway 11. And the bottom one is all the uh, concrete uh, and uh, the steel strain readings. So you can see with the variations and the fluctuations in the temperature, the steel um, and the concrete or strains also vary along. So as the temperature changes during the day and the night when we have fluctuations, the concrete uh, and the steel strains were also changing. Uh, so this is a, a good one where we can see a full comparison. Um, so we can see the average steel temperature, average concrete temperature, and ambient temperature. You can see the concrete temperature spiked up pretty high. The conduction of heat is much higher in this, I'm sorry, the steel girders. is much higher in the steel girders. So every time it peaked up, we had high temperatures during the time of the day, the temperatures peaked up, but we can also notice in February, we had a really dip in temperatures close to minus 10 degrees and within a few days, uh, within a week, we can see the temperatures again peaked up. The ambient temperatures reached close to 70 degrees or 60 degrees and the steel girders were heated up much more. So this temperature variations kind of give us more information and kind of correlate also with the steel uh, gradient and the strain gradient within the deck. So that, uh, that concludes our data from the field bridge. Now I want to talk about the other field bridge. It was a concrete, uh, uh, concrete girder bridge, precious concrete, where we were actually able to measure camber and precious losses using the sensors that we had. So this is a state highway four over the North Canadian River. Um, it had 15, 100 feet spans, 40 feet uh, width of roadway and each of them, they support the Ashto type 4 girders. The girders were simply supported and continuous over the joints. I think this is the same, this is like a prof profile of the bridge where we have all the cross sections there. 
Okay. Uh, so all the 15 girders had variations in the uh, precessing strands uh, and the steel. So this lists out all the variations uh, depending on the strand pattern that had some of them had mild steel in them. But for this uh, presentation and research, I'm going to pick three cases actually. So I changed the slide before, but I'll just give a quick description. We used a base case where we can have it as a controlled specimen, but we also had three different cases, uh, chose three different girders within that 15 girders, and we wanted to measure uh, the precess losses in camber using the vibrating wire strain gauges. So the, some of, one of them had mild steel in them, and th there was different stand pa strand patterns that was used. Uh, these variations and different uh, variant types of strand patterns are still have been used in Oklahoma bridges since 1977. So this was our uh, data logger system and all the types of sensors we used. Again, we used the CR1000 Campbell Scientific Data Logger. We had uh, the similar type of multiplexers. So we used a lot more vibrating wire sensors. We were able to uh, kind of connect them. You, you can see the cross section. You can see the pieces and stands there. We were able to build some kind of a tree or a bridge system where we can hold all the sensors in place. And we had the data logger box where all the sensors were wired in. This is another picture, a closer picture of all the location of the vibrating wire sensors. So the two most sensors um, that were mostly used for this project were the vibrating wire and the thermocouples. So we also, uh, we chose two for two different bridge girders, the Mark 27 and the Mark uh, 42. Um, today I will show uh, the results from one of the girders because they all were very similar. So we also placed the sensors in the end regions and in the mid span. We wanted to capture the strains in the end regions uh, in the pre stress concrete bridge uh, in these girders as well. So we also were able to capture this data during uh, during cast and then um, during uh, the, the tensioning side and then also storage and handling and installation. So the, throughout the whole period we were able to capture all these sensor data. This shows the profile of the type 4 um, Ashto type girder and you can see the location of the thermocouples which is denoted in the, the red circles here and all the square, blue squares are the geocon uh, vibrating wire sensors. So this uh, graph shows the measured concrete temperatures over a time of 900 days. So you can see uh, it's in the mid-span for the Mark 27 girder. You can see the fluctuations and the variations in uh, temperatures. And also you can note the dip in temperature here, right here, the, that below zero. And then within a few, um, yeah, you, can, you can see again the peak in temperature. So you can see the variations and fluctuations here. The next one. Okay, it didn't move for a long time. I'm sorry, this is not, excuse me for the, okay, now we went too far. It's taking a while. Yeah, it's, it's moving too fast. It's not, <laughs> okay, there it is. All right, so these were the measured concrete stains over long term. Uh, we had three vibrating wires, one measuring at the top, one in the middle, and one at the bottom. You can see all the strains at the time uh, of tensioning, and then you can see all these compression strains. And then once, um, once the, this is the tensioning time when, when the bridge deck is cast, sorry, when the bridge deck is cast and all these strains kind of converge into one. So this is a process of the load balancing that we all kind of try and achieve and have the same uh, strains throughout the profile of the girder. So right here at the time of bridge cast, we can see all the strains from the top and the bottom and the middle kind of converge into one and they continue and uh, continue to increase over time but not too much as they did initially when they were in uh, when they, after the time of cast. So uh, this is a great one to kind of, we talk about load balancing um, in precess bridge girders in our classrooms, but it's a great one to see how this actually happens when you actually cast a bridge deck on top of these girders.
This graph uh, shows how we calculated the, the precious losses from the strain data. So we were able to take the strain data and we multiplied it with the modular velocity of the precious in steel. We were able to get these precious losses. We were able to calculate them and uh, capture them. So we can see at the time of uh, bridge cast, we had a little bit of drop and then the precious losses continued to increase over time. So using the strain data, we same strain data, we were a, also able to calculate the camber. So basically we used the beam, beam mechanics and calculate the curvature and from that strain data we were also able to calculate the camber. So the yellow uh, or the orange triangles you see right here are physical measurements of camber that we were able to do on the bridge using um, the, the staff, uh, staff and rod method and, and tape. So though at regular intervals we were able to correlate with the actual predicted camber data. So the takeaway from, uh, from our research was that we were able to understand the type of structural monitoring to be implemented on steel and concrete bridges. And then we, uh, we were able to find out the, the data loggers and how to program them in and what kind of best sensors would best suit for this purpose of this research. And we were also able to achieve continuous remote mon monitoring. So the two field bridges that we installed sensors in are still working. We're still connecting, uh, collecting data from them. So we were able to kind of uh, get more information from that.